Well, thank you very much all for being here. I'm really um, delighted to be able to talk to you today. I, uh, I know ophthalmology is um, a little bit separate than a lot of other uh, medical fields. So I'm really excited that everybody's here and interested. I'm gonna be talking to you today about dry eye disease and ocular surface disease. I tried to bend it a little bit more towards uh, systemic associations so that you uh, can hopefully um, uh, it'll help you in your practice. Um, I am, uh, a, like, doc, like Sam said, I am um, a cornea specialist. I'm located in uh, University of Maryland downtown, as well as in the Redwood Clinic, as well as at, uh, I see patients in Owings Mills. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so the objectives today, I'm going to define dry eye disease. Um, we're going to go over some tests that we use for diagnosis of dry eye disease and uh, systemic diseases that are associated with dry eye disease, as well as some treatments. Um, so this is more of an outline of the talk, the anatomy we're going to go through, the definition of dry eye disease tests, and then we're going to talk about these diseases as well as inflammatory dry eye disease and treatments. So the ocular surface um, really involves uh, the tear film, the lacrimal gland, the conjunctiva, both the epithelium and goblet cells, the cornea, the clear part of the eye, um, including which has both epithelium. The corneal epithelium is really uh, the most involved area of the cornea, the eyelids, including meibomian glands and the immune system, both innate and adaptive immune systems are involved. So going over the normal tear film, there are really three major components to the normal tear film. There's the lipid layer and the aqueous and mucin layers. Um, and these, uh, um, so the lipid layer is from the meibomian glands, the aqueous and mucin layers are from the lacrimal gland and goblet cells respectively. Um, and we're gonna go into a little bit more detail on those. Um, so my bowing glands are involved in lipid secretion. The lipid layer um, helps to uh, prevent evaporation of the of the um, tears, as well as smooth the optical surface um, and stabilize the tear film. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty important for um, uh, maintaining a good ocular surface. Um, the meibomian gland dysfunction is the number one cause of dry eyes. So, um, as far as aqueous secretion, that's from the lacrimal glands. They secrete um, uh, most of the proteins found in the tear film. The basal tear secretion is from the glands of Krauss and Wolfring, which you can see here, um, and that are accessory glands. And reflex tearing is from the main lacrimal gland. Um, and finally, the mucin layer, um, uh, mucin 5AC is from the goblet cells, and they're also membrane-bound mucin, um, and, uh, and it allows, it prevents uh, bacterial adhesion and also helps with lubrication. So in order to study any disease, it's really important to have a, uh, a definition that everybody can agree on. So the TFOS does the... Um, Two came up with a, a clear definition of dry eye disease. And what's interesting here that we're going to highlight and come back to a few times during this talk is that um, dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film accompanied by ocular symptoms um, and tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiologic roles. And what's really important with this is that um, there are a number of different components to this definition that really um, will help determine both what tests we run as well as um, how to define dry eye disease uh, clinically. So the etiology of dry eye disease can be broken down into a number of different ways. I'm going to go through a few here. Um, but as far as uh, dry eye, you can have um, both uh, aqueous deficient as well as um, evaporative dry eye. And the reality is that this is more of a spectrum as opposed to total separation of these patients, but it's helpful to think about it in this way. So if you go down towards 
uh, aqueous tear production deficiency, you have Sjogren's and non-Sjogren's. So Sjogren's, we have primary and secondary, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail in a moment. But non-Sjogren's can be, um, aqueous tear deficiency can be due to lacrimal gland uh, dysfunction, lacrimal obstruction, cicatricial changes to the eyelids, and neurotrophic components. And then if you go towards evaporative loss, um, that's due to the meibomian gland dysfunction, exposure, or it can be caused by contact lenses or a problem with um, blinking or environmental factors. Oh, the slide got a little bit funny. But um, so another way to think about dry eye disease is based on the um, the cause. So if you think about it, about immune mediated versus inflammatory versus neurosensory and anatomical changes. Um, so immune mediated cause can affect the lacrimal gland causing aqueous tear deficiency or problems with the mucin layer um, causing uh, lipid layer abnormalities. Inflammatory changes can lead to decreased lacrimal gland secretion and hyperosmolarity. Um, and evaporative dry eye and bomian gland dysfunction um, can also fit into inflammatory causes. Um, neurotrophic keratitis is important for neurosensory changes. And anatomically, you can have post-surgical um, sensory denervation and abnormal blink. So um, I th this is my personal favorite way of thinking about it. It sort of combines both. Um, so if a patient comes into your clinic with dry eye disease, you can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. Um, so the classic patient is a symptomatic patient who comes in with symptoms of um, tearing and discomfort and a dry, gritty feeling or decreased vision. Um, and on exam, you see clinical signs of ocular surface disease or dry eye disease. And I'll go into um, a bit more details of that in a moment. Um, and then you treat it with, again, we're going to talk about it in more detail. But what's interesting here is to think about those patients that come in that are asymptomatic um, and then on exam, you see changes that are consistent with dry eye disease. And um, that can either be due to just early changes that the patient's not symptomatic from yet. And you can think about doing a preventative therapy or treatment for those patients. Or um, the patients can have a neurotrophic component and have poor corneal sensation. Um, and those patients are really ones that you want to focus on treating um, and want to treat pretty aggressively because they run the risk of, of perforation. Um, as far as symptomatic patients, you can have no signs, um, and those are patients that we would call uh, sign-symptom disconnect. And it's, it's a little bit of a discussion whether or not you treat it or just observe it because it's a little bit harder to treat because you don't really have an end point exactly for those patients. And then there's this other component that involves neuropathic pain um, and those you treat like any other neuropathic pain in the body, and you can either uh, refer for pain management or try gabapentin or an SSRI. So the pathophysiological mechanism of dry eye is pretty well studied, but it's also really complicated. And we're not going to go into these details today, but um, to break it down a bit for you here, the um, the mechanism of dry eye is this cyclical um, problem where it lead one issue um, can lead to the other, and you have to kind of break the cycle. Um, so you, if you have um, a patient with environmental factors or medications or contact lens issues, um, which causes irritation, and then they develop inflammation due to the irritation, um, which then causes deficiency of the tears, and then you get more irritation, and it just it continues in this path. And it doesn't really matter where you come into it, you end up with all the problems, which goes back to my point originally about that this is really a spectrum, even though we think about it a little bit separately. Um, so the underlying pathophysiology of dry eye disease to simplify it is just a combination of evaporative loss of the tear film and aqueous deficiency leading to damage of the ocular surface. So um, dry eye disease has a number of risk factors, including um, older age. Uh, women are at increased, have 
more dry eye disease than men, hormonal changes, uh, abnormal corneal innervation, um, vitamin deficiency, contact lens use, infection, or a history of ophthalmic surgery. The symptoms that patients complain of are dryness, irritation, foreign, foreign body sensation, light sensitivity, or itching. Um, and these patients are uh, have been shown to be more uh, associated with patients with anxiety and depression. Um, and then uh, this affects 5 million Americans over the age of 50, um, and two thirds of them are women. So it affects a lot of people. Um, and again, the diagnosis and management, we're gonna go into more detail on, but the, the way that I like to think about it is the four main categories of dry eye disease, the inflammatory, immunologic, anatomical, and neurosensory. Um, the symptoms, there's a wide range of symptoms. You can have mild irritation that um, is, minimally um, problematic to the patient, a significant decline in vision, and even perforation of the cornea. Um, so, um, so to go into the clinical exam, so um, the history and symptoms are probably the most, are very crucial to deciding what's, under, having a better idea of what's going on and what's really bothering the patient. Um, you also do a thorough slit lamp exam and um, it's paying special focus to the cornea, the conjunctiva, and the eyelids. Um, and then there are a number of clinical tests. Um, some of them are standard in most clinics and some are a little more um, uh, novel. So you look at you can look at tear breakup time, ocular redness, ocular surface staining. Schirmer's is a measurement of tear fluid production or tears um, and uh, fluorescein clearance test. Um, you can also have, uh, you can measure the tear fluid osmolarity, which is important because that's part of the definition of dry eye disease. And some newer test is uh, Inflamadry or MMP9, which is a measurement of um, inflammation in the eye, on the surface of the eye, excuse me. Um, and you can also measure, uh, have meibomian gland imaging, which is a nice way to look at the, uh, um, the structures of the meibomian glands. So tear breakup time, um, what you do for this is you place fluorescein in the eye um, using either fluorescein strip or, um, um, but you do it without anesthetic and then you have the patient blink and then you evaluate them for the dry spot. Can you see my cursor at all? Okay. So um, what you see here is when the patient blinks for the first time, they open their eyes and you see kind of diffuse green and then here you can see the breakup time where there are spots that aren't covered in that same green. Um, so uh, the normal tear breakup time is anything greater than 10 seconds. If it's less than um, you would want to think about dry eye disease. So to back up a little bit and talk about ocular surface staining in ophthalmology, we use three different stains. We use fluorescein most commonly, um, but we also can use rose bengal and lysamine green. So fluorescein um, stains areas of missing epithelium. The epithelium is the surface of the cornea. Um, it shows epithelial defects or erosions, um, and uh, it has the ability to permeate inside the cell as well. Um, it's used in, uh, for to evaluate the corneal epithelium, as well as to look for tear breakup time. That's the, the stain that we use. Um, you also have uh, rose bengal and lysamine green, and they, they basically do the same thing. They both stain live epithelial cells that have lost their mucin, um, but um, uh, rose bengal is a little bit more painful and a little bit more um, irritating to the patient. So. I tend to stick to lysamine green, um, but they're both available. Um, both rose bengal and lysamine green are much better at staining the conjunctiva or the white part of the eye. So that's um, definitely an important part to note. Uh, fluorescein really doesn't stain the conjunctiva as well. Um, so briefly to go into how we use these staining. Um, so if you see superior staining, so what you see here is that um, the hazy part is where there would be staining. So um, often there's actual epithelial defects or changes that are not 
diffuse, although you can get diffuse changes, which is associated with viral conjunctivitis and toxicity or very severe dry eye. But often where the staining is most prominent can really help you um, think about the differential diagnosis on these patients. So superior staining, you want to think about superior limbic keratitis or vernal conjunctivitis or floppy eyelids or um, contact lens induced limbal stem cell deficiency. You can see it with that, um, as well as a foreign body under the upper eyelid. Um, if you see interpalpebral or between the eyelids, which you can see here, that's more consistent with dry eye um, exposure and neurotrophic changes. Inferior staining is more consistent with uh, blepharitis or um, other forms of dry eye disease. Um, and uh, this is a particular staining, which is at 3 and 9 o'clock, and that's associated with the tight contact lens, which is interesting. So Shermer's is another test that we use. So Shermer's is uh, you use these um, uh, uh, strips in the outer one third of the lower eyelid. Patient closes their eyes for five minutes and then you get a measurement of the tears that are produced and less than five millimeters on the strip um, is uh, is very uh it's pretty specific for dry eye disease. Um, it's not as sensitive, but it is a very uh, useful test. Um, without anesthesia, you're measuring both the basal and reflexes tearing, but with anesthesia, you're only measuring the basal tears. Um, ocular surface disease index score is a measurement of, uh, is a questionnaire that's used for um, uh, uh, measure to measure the symptoms that patients are having for dry eye disease and what you can see um, it's that this this ocular surface disease index there has been very well validated there are many different questionnaires this is probably my favorite it's relatively easy and uh, fast and um, you get a good idea of how the patient's symptoms are affecting their daily lives um, and it's only 12 questions which is nice um, so these are a couple more tests, more um, uh, less standard uh, universally, but um, tear lab osmolarity um, is uh, an important test because again, it's part of the um, it's part of the definition of dry eye disease, but it's not necessary in order to diagnose dry eye disease. MMP9 is inflammatory. It's a point of care test in the clinic that is able to. Um, let us know if there's inflammation on the ocular surface. Um, that's one of my personal favorites. And then there's conjunctival impression cytology, which is really more of a, um, uh, really hasn't found a clear place in the clinic, but is still used for research. So um, to switch gears a little bit and talk about systemic diseases associated with dry eye disease, um, and the first one is definitely Sjogren's syndrome. Um, so this affects women more than females more than males with a 10 to 1 ratio. Um, primary Sjogren's is no other associated autoimmune diseases. Secondary Sjogren's is with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or other autoimmune diseases. Um, in order to diagnose it, you do a thorough history, um, including symptoms of dryness elsewhere, including in the mouth. Um, and then ocular signs, you do, Shermer's is very helpful, um, and uh, there's usually a lot of staining on these patients. Um, you can also do autoantibody tests, and we tend to refer these patients to rheumatology um, for further workup. Um, uh, ocular complications include filamentary keratitis, which you can see here, it's these deposits um, on the surface of the eye. These are actually attached to the cornea and they have this windshield wiper type of process which causes further irritation. Um, and then you can also get an infection, microbial keratitis, or a sterile ulcerative keratitis, which you can see here where there's thinning and melting of the cornea. Um, and that can lead to perforation. Um, so these we want to treat with both topical and systemic immunosuppression and punctal occlusion can sometimes help. Um, neurotrophic keratitis is, I guess, less of a systemic uh, problem, but um, you get uh, decreased uh, 
corneal sensation, and it can be caused by a number of different problems like a herpetic infection, diabetes, history of surgery, um, retinal surgery, or PRP, or laser uh, retinal changes can also cause uh, decreased corneal sensation, um, history of LASIK, um, also topical medications. So patients that are particularly on glaucoma medications can have this problem or any other topical medications that they've been on long-term um, or damage to uh, cranial nerve uh, five. Um, and then treatment for these is um, particularly important because the patient is not gonna have as much symptoms um, to, to help dictate um, any, uh, to give you an idea of what's going on. Um, so they can be pretty far progressed and um, not be aware. Um, so the treatments include uh, non-preservative artificial tears, serum tears, punctal occlusion, bandage contact lens can be used, um, or lateral tarsorophy, which is closing the eyelid, um, and uh, scleral lenses can also help these patients. Um, blepharitis is, a, is an important other cause of dry eye disease, so it, it's chronic inflammation of the eyelid margin. There's anterior and posterior types of blepharitis. Anterior is associated with staph, uh, um, staph cockle inflammation, um, as well as uh, posterior blepharitis is more focused on the meibomian gland dysfunction. Um, you can have both seborrheic, which is a hypersecretory um, uh, blepharitis, or hyposecretory blepharitis, which is meibomian gland plugging or loss of glands. Often you get both an anterior and posterior picture here. So to go into a little bit more detail on this, so staph blepharitis, it's really an immune response to the staph toxins. So it can cause marginal keratitis, which is inflammation of the, um, it, which causes uh, an infiltrate on the cornea. So it looks like small corneal ulcers on the periphery of the cornea. Um, you can also get flictenules um, and you get mattering of the eyelids or crusting, which you can see here, um, or loss of lashes. And this is really important to treat with lid hygiene as well as topical antibiotics. And in the right patient, you also need to treat with uh, topical steroids um, because um, you, it's the inflammatory or immune response that you're trying to quiet down. Um, but I would highly recommend making sure that the patient is being seen by somebody who's able to measure the, um, uh, measure the intraocular pressure if you're going to start a uh, topical steroid because the pressure can go up. Um, so hypersecretory meibomian gland disease, um, you get these greasy lashes. Um, it can be associated with seborrheic dermatitis elsewhere in the body. Um, and it also can occur with other uh, types of meibomian glands. This you treat just like any other seborrheic dermatitis with selenium containing shampoos. Um, so it is a different treatment. Um, so to go into my Bowman gland disease in a little bit more detail here, um, these pictures are helpful actually. Um, you get uh, symptoms of burning, watering, or blurring of vision, especially with reading. You can also get light sensitivity in these patients. Um, you get uh, inflammation of the meibomian glands and blockage of the meibomian glands, which you can see here. Um, and you get this increased blood vessel growth, the telangiectasia, um, foamy tear films, which I don't show here. And then you get these peripheral corneal ulcers, which are these white spots in the periphery of the eye. You can see them here as well. Um, and you get rapid tear breakup time in these patients. This is best treated with lid hygiene, so warm compresses and uh, lid scrubs, which is simply baby shampoo on uh, a clean washcloth, or you can use over-the-counter like OcuSoft lid scrubs or some other type of uh, lid wipes. Um, you can treat this with antibiotic ointments like erythromycin ointment or azithromycin, or you can also use a combination of steroids and antibiotics like Tobradex or Maxitrol. And uh, systemic treatment is with doxycycline. You start off at 50 milligrams twice a day, and then you can go down to once a day, but that's a long-term therapy um, for at least three months. Um, and that has both bacterial and anti-inflammatory components. Um, so rosacea keratitis is associated with my bone gland disease and blepharitis, but what, this is um, was a patient that I saw with 
among the most severe rosacea um, uh, blepharitis that I'd encountered. He actually had multiple perforations, um, um, but um, the, he was obviously treated systemically, but you get progressive corneal thinning and, uh, and risk of infection. Um, you want to treat these patients with both steroids and long-term restasis as well as doxycycline is probably the key here. That's systemic doxycycline. Other causes of um, blepharitis is demodex, which is um, these small mites that you can get on the eyelids, um, and uh, as well as contact dermatitis, which is usually caused by um, other eye drops. So my personal favorite of these diseases is um, ocular graft versus host disease. Um, so I have a, uh, um, a number of ocular GVHD patients. Um, so this affects uh, 40 to 60% of all patients who undergo aloe transplants are um, develop GVHD of those 60 to 90% with um, will develop ocular uh, changes. The uh, ocular GBHD is usually during the chronic phase from six to 18 months after a transplant. Um, and they get panocular surface disease um, and all of the ocular su surface structures that we've discussed are involved. Um, and it's, it's a robust inflammatory cause. Um, and this can cause uh, corneal blindness or and a significant decline in their quality of life. And again, this affects all uh, components of the ocular surface from the lids to the lacrimal glands to the conjunctiva and the cornea and the lens. It um, can be really detrimental to these patients. Um, and it's also a fascinating disease from a, 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 to study because we actually have, we know when it's uh, gonna start because we are involved in causing it. So there's a special diagnostic criteria for these patients, including corneal staining, um, conjunctival injection, a Schirmer's test, and ocular surface disease index. And we've gone through all of these tests uh, previously. Um, and then uh, there's, uh, you, you kind of add all of them up, and then depending on whether or not they have a diagnosis, a confirmed diagnosis of systemic graft versus host disease elsewhere in the body, um, you can diagnose them with either probable or definite ocular graft versus host disease. So um, what options do we have available for treating dry eye disease? Um, there's four basic principles that I like to think about. One is you can replace the moisture. You can treat the meibomian gland disease. You can prevent loss of the um, tears and you can control the inflammation depending on the cause of the dry eye disease. So to replace the moisture, you wanna think about preservative-free artificial tears or regular artificial tears, um, uh, uh, tear gels, ointment, um, or serum tears. For meibomian gland disease, you wanna think about warm compresses, erythromycin ointment, doxycycline systemically, um, and you can also think about intense pulse light, which we'll go into in a bit more detail. Um, and then uh, to prevent loss of the tear flow film, um, you want to you can use soft contact lenses or scleral contact lenses, which are larger contact lenses that are hard um, and go uh, instead of sitting on the cornea, they uh, sit on the white part of the eye and vault above the cornea and therefore continue to lubricate the surface. Um, you can also use moisture chamber goggles or environmental changes like humidifiers, changing the height of your computer screen, um, not uh, sitting near or sleeping with a fan. Um, there are a number of different uh, possibilities. And then you also wanna control the inflammation if it's present. So you do that with topically with steroids, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, like Restasis or Sequa, or systemically with systemic steroids, systemic tacrolimus, rituximab, or mycophenolate. And again, that's depending on the, um, the cause, the underlying cause of the dry eye disease as well as um, the patient's symptoms. So to go into a little bit more detail, so the way that for uh, dry eye, in most forms of dry eye disease, the way that you wanna think about it is in a stepwise approach. Um, so one uh, important thing is to educate the patient and explain to them why they're having their symptoms or how, um, uh, how, uh, what, how dry eye disease occurs. 
Um, and then you can talk about modifications to their environment, removing fans, lowering computer screen, uh, increasing uh, humidifier use, um, their dietary modifications, um, or you can, if they're on other medications, both systemic or topical, you can um, determine if you can stop or change some of them. For topical medications, you can use preservative-free formulations as possible. That definitely helps um, a number of patients. Um, and then lubrication with artificial tears, um, and then lid hygiene and warm compresses are sort of the baseline where we start. Um, a step further would you be using preservative free um, artificial tears if they have demodex um, you can think about tea tree oil um, you can uh, if they're non-inflammatory causes of dry eye disease you can think about punctal occlusion um, overnight you can use ointment um, although during the day that would cause blurring of their vision um, or moisture chambers you can also think about lipoflow or intense pulse light therapy um, and then there are some prescription medications that we can use like topical erythromycin ointment um, or an antibiotic and steroid combination um, or you can do uh, um, a short course of a low potency steroid like lodomax um, or you can also use anti-inflammatory medications like lofitograst um, or uh, um, doxycycline systemically um, if that's uh, not sufficient, then you can think about um, uh, autologous serum tears, um, which is where we take the, um, you do a blood draw, it gets processed and spun down to serum. It's mixed with preservative free artificial tears, and it really helps to um, uh, certain patients. It can make a big difference in the, in um, improving the ocular surface. And then you can also talk about therapeutic contact lens. These are not for, uh, vision changes necessarily they're more for the surface so again the scleral lenses or even soft contact lenses can help if all of that's not helpful then you can think about a longer uh, course of steroids amniotic membrane uh, graft um, you can surgically or more permanently uh, have punctal occlusion or um, uh, tarsorophy or closing the eyelid um, which actually can make a, a huge difference and you can really make um, big strides forward in the right patient. Um, and then um, cyclosporin is restasis or CEQA, um, and that's more helpful in patients with uh, inflammation, um, or although patients with severe tear film insufficiency um, usually can't tolerate it as well, especially at the beginning, they have lots of burning. Um, and it takes a couple of months to work. So you want to start the steroids at the same time that you start Restasis um, or Cyclosporin um, and kind of taper them appropriately as it starts to kick in. Um, there was a question about tea tree oil. I think in the right patient population, um, that's really helpful, but um, that's more for treatment of Demodex as opposed to um, just in general uh, dry eye disease patients. So it, it needs to be targeted appropriately. When it's appropriate, it can have really nice results. Um, and again, the refractory dry eye disease, you want to think about the serum tears, which I really like, and scleral contact lenses. Um, so scleral contact lenses, um, they sit, so this is a patient wearing a scleral contact lens, and what you can see is the edge of the, of the hard lens, and you can tell from the um, the light beam slip beam that you can um, that the that it's kind of vaulted over the cornea um, and it causes a pretty marked uh, improvement in corneal staining in the ocular surface so you can see here is outside um, the the space that the contact lens sits and you can almost see where the contact lens is sitting and how uh, much of an improvement they have prior to starting scler scleral contact lenses as a patient had diffuse staining um, even though you can see pretty remarkable results with scleral lenses, they're definitely not um, without their uh, drawbacks. They're harder to use. They need patients need to be trained how to use them. Access to scleral lenses is a little bit challenging, um, and uh, some patients still uh, uh, 
don't necessarily just can't tolerate them. But when you really have no other options, they're great, especially in really severe dry eye cases. Graft versus host disease patients do remarkably well with these, as well as Sjogren um, uh, SJS patients. Um, so Lipaflow and uh, intense pulse light, it's um, basically just warms the meibomian glands and then massages them and then helps to excrete the, um, the sebum. Um, but patients can really uh, show some nice results from them. Um, the neuropathic component to dry eye disease is actually very interesting. Um, the, it's, it's more challenging to treat because um, you don't necessarily see it as much on exam, but um, things that we can use to treat it is autologous serum tears, contact lenses, like I talked about. You can use systemic therapy with tricyclics, uh, calcium channel blockers, um, and gabapentin. Also, lifestyle changes can have a big effect on these patients. Improving sleep, exercise, hydration um, can really make a difference. So just to review the four principles of management, and really in most patients, we do a combination of all of these and wanna address the various components. Um, you wanna replace the moisture, treat the meibomian gland disease, prevent loss of the tear film with lenses or moisture chambers, um, and control the inflammation. So um, in conclusion, dry eye disease is a complex disease. Um, the patient's history is really important for identifying the underlying etiology, which allows you to treat it um, more appropriately um, and to target the treatment for the underlying cause. And not all dry eye disease is the same or should be treated the same depending on the severity or the cause. Um, or in some cases, if there's um, uh, more of a cause due to inflammation, you obviously don't want to wait until you've you've gone down your list to get to anti-inflammatory medications you want to start that sooner so um this slide basically puts together all of this so you want to ask the question um if you think it's dry eye disease you look at risk factors diagnostic testing um, that we went through classify them and then it's a spectrum so you want to treat it depending on um all the different components.